so that to anybody here is a player, and and the thinking a little bit of anybody else, not to chat, not to negate what you think, but just to add something to it. Um, to me, all the jazz music is made up by people who want to figure out what they want to play and what they think expresses their, their ideas. That's it. So when you learn how to play jazz, you learn what they did. But when they play jazz, they're trying all the time to play something that no one ever heard before. OK? So one of the reasons that jazz is a little bit jammed up right now is because a lot of people, young people, learn to play what everybody else has done rather than what they might do for themselves. So a lot of the education is about here's how to play jazz rather than here's how people have played jazz. What do you want to do? So I'm, a, I'm on the faculty at New England Conservatory of Music in the jazz department and in the contemporary improvisation department. And um, uh, oh, I see my, my kids are here now, so they can play later. That's good. Uh, and uh, I, I teach things this way. Some people call it free jazz. Some people call it free improvisation. There's a history of free jazz. There's a history of free improvisation. And sometimes people say they have nothing to do with jazz, which I think is nonsense. Uh, and what I set out to do is prove in a lot of different ways what other people have proven, but maybe a little bit more succinctly and a little bit more academically, perhaps, that they are absolutely connected and that everybody uses the same material, but they use it in a way to express themselves. The same way you would if you were writing songs or if you were, hey, you're in, you arrived at my talk thing, so you can come on up. You don't have to stay, but you can come up. Uh, and so this is for the the, the non-conservatory trained type people, so you, you'll have to bear with me a little bit. Uh, and we have some high school students here. Uh, so what I did was I made, a, I, I made a pretty detailed way of teaching something that has otherwise been really not detailed very well. And I call it the properties of free music, which means I break down all the stuff that people use in free improvisation and I show people how to use it. So when you guys come to hear me play, that's what I'm using all the time. Maybe like, well, where's the music come from? And if you stick around, you'll hear us playing later, and you'll be like, well, how do they know what to do? So what I'm going to do today is to explain how we know what to do so that no one ever has any doubt, except Chris Patel, who will never figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> He'll never figure it out, especially if you have Carl tested. They'll never know what the hell's going on. It's just the need of them is, you know. OK. So I break it down into a few different things. Things that everybody uses in every kind of music that they improvise on. Some emphasize more of one than the other, but throughout the history of it, everybody's used all these things. They use it one way or another. Uh, you could say that, you know, we talked, I'm sorry, what's your name again? Marie. Marie. Marie and I talked about how you guys might have played some monk tunes a little uh, over the, this week with T.S. Monk, and you had to play through some chord changes, or at least you took a shot at it, and you do some of that in school. That kind of music is based on a harmonic structure. The way you improvise on it is to use the rhythm and the melody, but if you don't deal with the harmonic structure, the way the chords work, what the, what the notes of the chord, what scales you can use with the chord, what the arpeggios are with the chord, for those of you who don't understand this, you get a little bit of information on this, uh, you're not gonna sound right with the music. You know, great people like Charlie Parker, they could, they could be very lucid and very imaginative using a, a simple chord progression, and they can embellish that in a lot of different ways. They can reharmonize it. They know everything about harmony, so they can do that. And they're great artists with a great passion and a great drive and great articulation and great sense of rhythm and all these other things. And, but primarily, they're focusing on a harmonic structure. In free jazz, the main focus is on a melodic structure and a rhythmic structure, okay? They don't use chords. In Ornick, have you guys ever heard of Ornick Coleman? Anybody here ever heard of Ornick Coleman? <laughs> heard of Ornick Coleman? Ornick Coleman, a little bit. <laughs> Arnett Coleman's a saxophone player who really started his work in the, in the mid-50s as a kind of bebop player using a harmonic structure and gradually decided to forget about the chords and just use the melody. And so he's one of the inventors of free jazz. Another inventor of free jazz is Cecil Taylor, and who did the same thing kind of at the same time, even a little bit earlier in New York City, so he's kind of credited with being one of the first. But it goes back before then. Guys like Lenny Tristano, and uh, Warren Marsh and some other people used that early in the 50s in jam, but they couldn't really get a gig and they didn't really figure out how to do it as well. Ornette Coleman is in some ways the great genius originator of it because when he used a melodic structure, 
he made melodies that were more distinct than the harmony would have been. So the melodies are really, really incredible in Ornette Coleman's music. And because of that, they, gave, they had a great intervallic shape, a great rhythmic shape. And so they were very distinctive. And so you could use a lot of the material in that as a template. And this is a key thing. And uh, I'll get, are you guys willing to play? Do you feel like playing? Good. Get your instruments out. We'll get you guys playing. And maybe somebody else will come up and play. I'll get Andrew or Jake or somebody. And so, so what, they, what Arnett did is he, and what Cecil did is they wrote melodies and then they let people improvise. So we do that all the time when we play. Although sometimes we improvise a melody. And every time there's a bit of melodic structure there, it's in my language, but I think it's derived from the, 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 the sort of history of this music. People use those mel melodic structures as a template, as a shape. So if you hear, you hear that, it, it, and, and you remember it, and you think about the rhythmic component of it, the pitches, the intervals, and you say, okay, play something after that. Just repeat that. You hear that, right? What, what pops out? Well, the, the, the value of the notes, the accents, the, the arc of the melody, the intervals, little bits and pieces in it. So every single thing in that becomes some part of a big template. Does this make sense to you guys? So it's a template, right? So if you go, you know, la di da di da di da Okay, and I, if I said, okay, play four things that sound like la di da di da di da la di da di da di da Okay, maybe you have to change key. la di da di da di da Maybe you have to go higher. la di da di da di da But you have some part of it that you're basically expanding on. It's that simple. And as it gets more and more elaborate with the melodic structure, the freedom to be more and more elaborate with the, with the uh, improvised structure grows. Right? So if you have more to work off of, then you have more to grab a hold of and more to improvise on. Does that make sense so far? Oh, you have a violin. You can use my amp if you want. Yeah. That's it right there. You can plug it in. And feel free to grab chairs. Let me get you guys to demonstrate it for me. I think some other people have Hi. Thanks for coming. Thanks everybody for coming. I'm Heather. I work with Project Storefronts. Yes. Uh, we have this building, as you can see, so hopefully we can continue with the jazz series and have fun. So enjoy yourselves and have some drinks if anybody needs a glass of water or anything right up front. Yay, Heather McDonald. Yay. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. So anyway, this is our pre-concert talk. I never did it. I, I talk a lot. People here who are students, <laughs> students of mine know how much I talk. I haven't done this kind of thing much. So come on up. You can come up and sit, and I'll have you guys demonstrate. You, can, you guys can do my, my, uh, my, my uh, you'll, you'll prove that what I'm saying. Okay. I thought there'd be more. It would great. They say it's like Lego. Every, one of these, every smart kid has been lucky enough to get a Lego. That's one of the reasons they're smart. They're, Somebody got, got them Lego. So my analogy for that, to understand this, about how you're going to look at this free music thing, is that if somebody gives you Lego and it says castle on the, on the box, and there's a picture of a, of a castle, and then you, you know, it's like, okay, that's how it's supposed to look, right? That's how you want to do. You need help with that? Is it yeah. standby on? Standby. So my, my way of explaining this is bebop, a harmonic structure, works like this. You get the tune, that's the Lego. You get the, the chord progression, that's the picture of the castle. And then you open it up and there's a booklet that says step one, step two, step three, step four. Now if, when you're just beginning, like you said, you're learning how to, you can, you can navigate your way through a chord progression. You're going to put it together one step at a time, and in the end, it's going to look just like a castle on the bottom, right? You're going, wow, that's good. You know, a kid with no imagination takes that, puts it away, and never plays with it again. Most kids take it apart and then build their own stuff, right? My idea about free music, a good way to explain it is that it says castle on it. There's no picture and there's no instructions. 
There's no instructions. So you have to think, what do I want a castle to look like? Okay? But because it says castle, there's some parameters. There's some expectation. Like, you, you know, you might go, I'm just going to play whatever I want. Well, you know, the question is, can you? No. You can only play what you know how to play. You can't play more than you know how to play, even if you're just reconfiguring it with improvisation. So if you can play one scale, or you can play five notes, or if you pick up a guitar and you go, bling, you know, and that's all you know how to do. Well, that's all you know how to do. So you're going to have to learn a lot of other things about music to be able to make whatever you want be, to actually sound like something, right? It takes a lot of skill to improvise. Just like if you said, I'm going to make a castle out of all these blocks, you have to know how they fit together. You have to know what a castle is. You have to know that it's not a pile of blocks. That's, that's the broken down castle, which is now just rubble. It's not a castle anymore. You don't go, look at that castle. It's a pile of rubble. It's only a castle if it stands and it serves a purpose, a function of a castle. The same thing could be said about a church or any other structure. What we're talking about is using our own decisions to build a musical structure. Okay. Now, some of you guys who are bearded, who come to all these things. <laughs> we, got, we got like young, some young people and a bunch of guys who look like you. <laughs> we're trying to change that, actually. Then some of the people playing with me, they're more they're closer to you guys than to all of us. <laughs> but without these guys, it's not, nothing like this ever happens. So um, you might know that that's what we're out to do. And so you, you can enjoy the process, the result that we come up with. But what we're trying to do is come up with a result. So we have to start somewhere, right? We have to start somewhere. So we take the whole thing apart. Now, throughout the history of free improvisation, there's a bunch of people who created really formal methodologies about how to do it. They didn't do it overnight. They might have started and they got, you know, if you can say, okay, here's my plan. And then five years later, the plan expanded. Ten years later, the plan expanded. And over the course of their lives, their music isn't just a bunch of tunes or a bunch of pieces that they wrote. It becomes a methodology for how to use those pieces. One of the greatest examples of an artist who does that is Anthony Braxton, who lives in, who teaches at Wesleyan and lives in Middletown, and Carl Testa, who's the bass, great bass player who's standing back there, works with him, so he knows that. They, he's somebody in our area. He's one of the great, great innovators and great geniuses of this whole form of music, and he lives a stone's throw if you have a good arm from here. And someday he'll actually come out from down here. <laughs> someday. Yeah. Uh, good so what their work is really about creating a way to do this, right? So if we say, well, it's free improvisation, it's free music, you can do whatever you want, then you go, and by the way, here's what I want you to do. Here's a million things. So my thing with this, because I don't think of Anthony Braxton or Arnold Coleman or any of those, is more of like a meta methodology, which is really a kind of convoluted way of saying thinking about playing based on thinking about playing based on thinking about playing. So I don't compose so much and then say, okay, play this like this. What I say is, let's use these things that are always there and just improvise. It's like saying, okay, build a castle, then build a church. You build a church, you build a castle, you build a church castle. Okay, let's all do it together, okay? Let's, so then we have to go up to do the bits and pieces. And the first thing that we that we come to, which I mentioned before, is the melodic structure, right? The first thing that all this stuff is built on is melody. The reason that people have started using melodic structure, for those of you who don't know, is that the harmonic part of it just restricted them, you know? It's like you go, hey, mom and dad, I don't want to just build this castle ten times, you know? Like, can I just make what I want? And if you're, you know, they all go, well, of course, and then they give you the big bin, and then there's $10,000 worth of Lego in there. Wait, I'm talking about my own life. Wait, my own kids. Right, there's $10,000 worth of Lego in this bin, and every now and then your kid sorts through it and goes, look, I made the smallest thing I could. Right? Okay. So it's like that. So, we'll, so, right. so what, we're, what I'm talking about is taking the, apart the music and making it into blocks. So that every little bit of this is like a block that you put together. So you can start with three notes. You can start with just th any three notes. Well, I'll give you three notes. How about that? Um, uh, but let me just say a little bit more about it. So we're going to take that three notes, those three notes, we can think like, uh, I'll play them on the guitar. We can think like we'll expand them. Uh, 
with adding a fourth note. We can think that um, we can change the duration of the notes. We can, we can, uh, uh, and we'll start there. So, now for those of you who think, wow, we should make sure that everybody sounds like their master improvisers within the next, by four o'clock this afternoon, okay? <laughs> I wouldn't put that on them, but it's not gonna happen because uh, you gotta know a lot, and we, I'd rather have everybody get started on this with really good information so that when, they're, when they leave here, they can hang around and do this with their friends, and then they'll have to think about whether or not they're doing it right. Like basically if I said, okay, make up three melodies and play them and improvise on them, improvise on them. Here's a few ideas of what you can do. One, you can add a note. You can repeat it. So let's play, let's do this first. We have all C instruments here, thank God, no transposing. Let's just play A, B, C. beginning here folks. So we'll repeat it, let's repeat it three times and then add one note. One, two, three. Ah, it went dissonant, good. Okay, let's take those five notes and add another note. You guys do it, okay? Add four notes and add, add another note. Two times, add one note and then add two notes, okay? One, two, three. Play the first C, D, and E, I mean, sorry, A, B, C. You play that twice and then add any other note. And then, then do it one more time and add two notes.
I always like, I don't know why I play flute. I always like playing bass. You gotta get a bass flute. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be yeah. cool. Yeah, um, there's, a, there's a student at um, NEC uh, who's a good friend of the guys that were gonna play with me um, named Joel Wagner, who I hope to have here one day, who plays bassoon. Who's rigged it? And there's another one named Catherine Young who works a lot with Carl or has worked with Carl who does this too. She's got it rigged up to a like a PA and uses the bassoon to be basically a bass instrument. And it changes the way the bass works and changes the way the bassoon works. And you know that's the kind of thing this kind of music offers. But what these guys just said just describes what we all do when we improvise together. So they understand this already. I mean. They're listening to one another. They're making decisions about what they think will sound good. So, you know, when you read all this stuff and it's a big convoluted thing about who's right and who's wrong, it's just a question of how imaginative everybody can be with a melodic structure. Once you have the simplest little melodic structure and you decide to actually act on it and build something with it, it becomes form, right? There was enough form there for you to make a whole bunch of decisions and still know what you were doing if you needed to, right? So I always tell my students, Take it, stretch it as far as you can, and if you think you're getting lost, play the original part. That's what Arnett Coleman does. So if you look, if you go home and you listen, look online and listen to some Arnett Coleman stuff, and uh, uh, if you want, Pat Smith can give you my email address, or I can email some links and you can check that stuff out so that, because um, you can't give out strangers' email address. Um, have, have Pat Smith do that. Um, if you listen to that and you hear, you know, Ornette playing a whole bunch of notes, he's doing the exact same thing. He's, he's making a creative decision based only on what he thinks sounds, sounds good. Originally, what he said was he liked bebop, in, in particular Charlie Parker, who of course is a contemporary of Thelonious Monk. He loved his articulation, and everybody here used articulation as well. He loved his articulation, but he thought because of the harmony, he had to play patterns, right? That's what you have to do. First, you have to learn how to play arpeggios and scales, and so it was harder to just do whatever the heck you wanted. But if there's fewer rules, then you start to impose rules on yourself and you start and collectively come to a decision about what happened. Now, with one minute of work, you guys played something that you never played before that wasn't written down, that sounded pretty together because you were all listening. The listening part is key. So you listen for rhythms, right? I heard you listening for rhythms. You listen, listen for pitches. You listen for repetition, you listen for form, you listen to know where you are all the time with what you have. That's what we do all the time. When you hear me playing this, that, I'm hearing, that's what I'm listening to because I like to hear that more than, <laughs> that's a little too much, that's a little too much for me. I, you know, I'm going to use that if I think I need to, but I'm at the point where I, I want to hear this. So when you hear me do that later with my uh, with my colleagues, you're going to go, what the heck is that guy playing? I'm playing the exact same thing. I hear it as melody, and I, I process it as a melodic structure, right? Okay, so let's do this one little thing again, and let's think about pulse. Because now that we have at least a basic understanding, I think a pretty good understanding, of what how a melodic structure can function as a template, right? And how we can, you know, I mean, we, we could spend weeks with scores and all kinds of stuff, elaborating on that and learning how to process all of it. But just for the sake of today, to get us jump started, we'll assume that we know enough about that. The next thing that you have to do is you have to think about the pulse, right? So if we're thinking, we put a little bit of a rhythm on it, but if we think about the pulse, and if we want to make it sort of a jazz pulse, we'd have to, say we, say we said one, two, three, four, one, two, three, we can take it straight, or we can put an accent on the two and four. One, two, So this time, take that melody, and let's think about the pulse. It's harder to do. It takes a different technique. But if you're playing with straight, eighths or quarter notes over a straight pulse. You know, if you play classical music, it tends to be even quarter notes. Nothing's accented too much. And the notes over it are even as well. And your, your feeling about the tempo is more like this. It'd be counted in like this, and you count it like this, like sort of based on a bow stroke. 
You know, so things that are classical are going to go more like this, a little more pastoral. And the trick is to blend everything together so nothing sounds too accented. But in jazz, in African-American derived music, which has informed everything that's improvised in the 20th, 20th century and into the 21st century, the rhythm is more like the hammer down. It's really, it's here. And so everything goes to that. Instead of going nice and nice and nice and nice, it's more like, like this. It's very abrupt. And that gives you more opportunity to accent. It also gives you, you can put a lot more energy on that. And so that means if you want to play, you can do that on it. If you want to play whatever you want, if you want to go, it works better if you're going here and you go, it just, everything has to come back around, right? But if you, if you start here, you start here, it gives you a little bit more leeway to play around with the value of the notes, the accent on the pulse, and the rhythm, which is why jazz sounds different than classical music. That's the main reason, you know? It's because the way rhythm is used is different. You guys follow me on that? So if you guys hear me doing this, I'm thinking of the pulse like this. Uh, my student calls it hummingbird. Joe the hummingbird, she put a picture of me up. This is the same student. She put a picture, a horrifying picture of me as a hummingbird with my worst <laughs> photograph head on it. Because I said, like, my sense of time is always like, like this. But I can subdivide that. However, I, I mean, I can have that. I can take it down to where I think and still have this energy in there. That way, if I want to go like all kinds of clutter against this long thing, makes sense. Whereas if I think here and I go, I have to wait. I have, in order for it to sync up, I have to sync it. The, the subdivision of the pulse is not the same. So let's try this with, da, da, da. we'll take it like that. And then, so use that as a melody, and then just break it down to where you're, you're, um, you, you can subdivide all those notes to smaller durations or longer durations. Okay? Ready? A, B, C. So you got this rhythm? One, two, one, two, three, four. version of the properties of free music for those of you who, okay, this is the read it on the back of a matchbook. Okay, there's a lot more to this, but these guys got it, man. They're, you, you're, you sound great. Okay, so that version of the pulse is where it's stated. If we play bass, if I play bass, which I could have done there, I don't have a melodic, stru a harmonic melodic structure rhythmically and modulate it through the keys. You know, so you go. Right? So you're basically using the template of melody and making harmony with it by having it go through a bunch of different key centers. It's complicated. But anyway, I told you so you know. So next time we'll go there. Um, 
So what Cecil did was he used little units of melody. Simple melody. And he added things to it. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff there. You think, well, what the that's just playing around. One thing that holds that together is that there's an implied pulse. I always call it like the primordial pulse. It's like, you know, and everything else is a subdivision of it. In his case, his like default time is double hyperactive um, uh, Red Bull. Hummingbird. He's like, he's like a nuclear hummingbird. So his idea of like time is like, it's the primordial energy, right? So we have the, the pulse of nature, boom, on off, boom, and then we have the sweeping, most nuclear, intense, sacred rendition of what energy is. So in other, in, or, in other words, everything is so intense that you can barely keep up with it. And that gives him the entire range of intensity, right? And so that pulse is then implied. So nobody has to state it. So, you know, you might go, instead of that one where you go, the pulse is stated. You hear that two and four, guys? does is he doesn't need anybody to state it. He just assumes it's there. And it could be rendered in a whole bunch of different, uh, at different temping, right? It could be really divided from the slowest and played to the slowest. At the same time, it's played to the fastest or the, or the most divided to the 32nd, 64th. And it's always rubato to the pulse. You guys know what rubato means? Basically, elastic. So it doesn't have to be in sync. So what they do is they improvise on it using rhythmic displacement. So they might play it, stay, they, they could stay it this way. Or they might go. It's another thing that they have, another little block that they have in the building of their castle. Another little musical device that they get to do, to use against this implied pulse, different than the stated pulse, right? Where they go. I'm doing the simplest thing here, guys. I'm trying to get a lot done. So let's, this time, let's use that same little melody. with an implied pulse. That means you can do whatever you want. You don't have to state it. And, and what you want to do is break down that figure to as many different subdivisions as the no, of the notes as possible and harmonize. And I don't expect like massive successful results. Just give it a shot. In that case, I'll walk a bass line that I think would be sort of rebuttal to the pulse too. A lot of times they're accented pretty sharply, which gives it. Now I'm still feeling this, but I'm, what I'm doing is I'm improvising off of it too. We're assuming that it's there, but none of us are stating it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That makes sense to everybody? Yeah. All right, good. <laughs> Finally, Stephen Haynes is figuring it out. <laughs> <laughs> he gets it. All right, so let's do that same figure. Do whatever you want with it, but let's think about the pulse, and then we'll stop and ask, I'll have you guys ask me questions for, you know, three, four hours. Right? <laughs> Let's just jump in because we're not going to count it. So we'll just all start. Ready?
exactly what I was talking about. So let me just ask. You knew where you were when you were doing that. You, you did exactly what I asked you to do, right? So you knew, did, you know, you knew what you were dealing with the pulse, and you were moving this figure around, adding notes, displacing, using different values of the notes, right? Well, that's what free improvisation is about. You're basically, it, I, I like to think of it as like rock climbing. You know, you're sort of, there's not a whole lot to hold on to, but if you keep going up and you keep reaching for something, there's something to hold on. And if you use that little bit of information, in that case, a, the simplest rendition of a melodic structure and the most basic way of processing, and the simplest or two different versions of how to relate to the pulse, that's what, three, four things that you can do. Then the rest is playing some notes and doing what? Listening, right? And trying to build form. So the last part is building some form. So anyway, I'm gonna stop because we have other things going on and thank you. Thank you guys very much. These are all students at the co-op high school. Or don't know what's going on. And I did just give the talk and explain it, but I will talk. So I like the idea of arcade, but the other thing is, I'm kind of an old nostalgic romantic for old corny amusement park things, and so I found a bunch of pictures that look good. <laughs> so this is all about free improvisation for anybody who wonders what we're doing. Uh, uh, and uh, we're just going to improvise. We're going to do two sets. Um, I want to thank Heather McDonald and Vivian Nabetta for, from the city for, for And I have to thank my, my incredibly important friend, Doug Morrill, from the Center for American Music and Jazz Haven, who, wouldn't, who made this happen. Thank you, Doug. We would not have a set of vibes without Carl Testa and Nick Lloyd. Nick Lloyd who loaned it to us from Fire and And everybody else who helped. And, and to the great students from West, Western Connecticut State University and the Co-op High School came and played before. I appreciate that very much. Uh, this is Andrea Nicodemo on Vibes. Pat Keen on Bass. Jake Baldwin on trumpet. Uh, one other thing before we start. I decided on everything I do like this in New Haven, whether it's here at, Pro at uh, Project Storefront or any other place, is going to be about people like them. Young people who are uh, amazing musicians who aren't known. You know, this is one of, the, in, in this city, this, this is all about people coming here and doing things that haven't happened before. I learned about this music in this neighborhood and uh, in the 70s, and that's one of the things that this city lets people do is just be who they are and listen. People listen, and they formulate what it is, and they take it from there. And so I I'm going to make sure that whoever plays with me on these things are new people, new amazing musicians. So thank you very much for coming, and uh, we appreciate you being here. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you. 
Jake Baldwin. I Thank you.